Yes. Okay. Yeah, well, we can see your screen. Oh, you see my mouse pointer? Yeah, yeah. All right, yeah. great. Okay, well, thanks for inviting me. It's always nice to get the opportunity to share some of my work and uh, maybe have some nice discussion with some uh, people who work on different applications. So today we'll talk about uh, constraints and optimization for weekly supervised deep learning in case you have few data and fewer labels. Uh, so it essentially, uh, I work on the question, what do you do if you don't have enough labeled data to train deep neural networks? Can you use something else than uh, annotations that uh, were manually created? So learning from uh, a single example is possible or a few examples and a few categories that are um, often mentioned are like when you work with partial annotations uh, but if, if you don't have that, you can work with weak annotations, more like higher level information, like image captions, for example, like a text description of what's in the image. Uh, and another alternative is to work, uh, formulate things as constraint optimization, and I will discuss mainly this category. And I'll show some applications in uh, remote sensing, uh, seismic interpretation, and image processing. So the basic idea of uh, supervised learning for uh, semantic segmentation is that we have just an image and we wanna train a network that outputs say a semantic segmentation. So every object of the same type gets one color. Uh, with seismic data, you can do the same thing where you have a seismic image and you uh, every sort of geological type of the same uh, class gets the same color. It uh, doesn't matter where in the what where you are, just if you have a every pixel with the same class gets the same color. So uh, to start with some notation, what what we try to do uh, in the is train a network. So I indicated by just a nonlinear function g that depends on k that are the network parameters, say convolutional kernels in a convolutional neural network and some input data D. So D would be say the, the image that you plug in. And then uh, training a neural network uh, in this notation just means minimizing the difference between the output of the network. So what comes out of your function G and compared to the label C. So these would be the labels say the, uh, the, the goal, what you want to try to match. And L is then a loss function. Uh, for example, uh, cross entropy for these type of applications. So in semantic segmentation, then uh, the size of the network, uh, the mapping is, if you have n pixels in your image, you would go from n by the number of channels in to n times the number of classes out. Uh, or if you factorize it, you just take the product of these two. So the, the following example shows what will happen. So you have one input image, that could be three RGB channels. Uh, if there's two classes, you get two outputs uh, images of your network, each of them showing the probability that uh, this class occurs at this pixel. So this would be the presence of an object class, the, and this would be the presence of background. And then the, the, the nice sharp images are typically just the result of thresholding, just post-processing and looking at each pixel and deciding what's the most likely uh, class at that pixel. So in this case, you just take the maximum of the two. For this example, uh, where you have RGB input, you would have three channels, input and n pixels. And the output would be in this case, 12. There's 12 classes. Uh, and of course, also for n pixels. So there'll be a map from 3n to 12n. Of course, this, uh, well, everybody can kind of annotate these, these images. That's not very difficult. It's of course, very time consuming and therefore costly. And in the seismic case, like where the data is not visual, but uh, experts have to look at it, it would also be potentially unreliable because it's not, um, it's not obvious what is what in these type of uh, uh, non-visual data types. So what you can do to reduce the cost, there's a couple of options. Uh, one of them is, for example, point annotations. That's, that's shown in uh, the middle here, where I just ask people to click 
once on every object type. Uh, that will give you a few pixels at a very low cost. It's very fast. Another alternative using the squiggles. So you just draw a simple line through uh, an object and you get a lot more pixels and it's also quite quick. Uh, this is of course also easy most of the time unless you have very narrow curvy objects where it's, uh, you have to still trace accurately. Uh, so this sort of works in general uh, image uh, recognition classification segmentation type work. Uh, if you have like hundreds or thousands of uh, images with one point or a few points, they can think of oh, this will work because you got uh, in the total amount of labeled information you have is still a lot. So the question is, does this still work if you have just a single or maybe a couple of images with some points annotated? Um, so let's take a look at a simple example where we have, uh, this is most of the state of Arizona in plan view. So this is just a topographic map of uh, say Arizona. And then on the same map, you've got just gravitation, uh, magnetics and gravitational data, but also uh, discrete data like rock agent types. Um, so in the network, you would split these maps out into one map per rock type or rock age, uh, because otherwise this is not uh, like permutation invariant with respect to the color map. So you, do, you cannot use that directly. Uh, this would be a very large 2D data case with 56 channels. So there's like 20 or so in each of these ones. And the true aquifer map that I have here is uh, really what people have constructed. So that's not ground truth. It's what people have worked on over years or decades to construct that. And suppose you have some point annotations, uh, say information from boreholes where people have uh, drilled or investigated what aquifer type is there or what is not there. Uh, so this is a, one image with some points. It's a large image though. And the result, uh, a prediction here is, you can see here the difference between the map that is constructed by people and by the machine. So this is really an advanced interpolation extrapolation task and they match quite well. So it's, uh, it just shows that even with one image and just partial annotation, you can construct something that uh, is, a, is a good segmentation. So you, you don't need uh, hundreds or thousands of images. Uh, There's another example where you have a, a video. So that's a 3D array. And suppose we're just giving a few time slices of the annotation, then uh, it, is, it is still possible to just training on that video. So no large data set, just train on a single video. You can train a neural network to segment every time slice. Uh, so this was a, a 3D uh, convolutional network that we trained. And with seismic data, you have similar situations where you don't have full annotations. You often have just in one slice, uh, if you're lucky, two boreholes uh, that give you some information. Uh, so these colors would be, again, the, the lithological uh, units that you're interested in. So while uh, supervised learning is, of course, learning from examples, we can actually learn without ever seeing even one fully annotated example. And so, uh, but you still need sufficiently many points uh, lines or patches annotated. Uh, so there's no time to discuss really why, why you can do this, but uh, I can just mention a few words that this is actually very similar as what you do in geophysical inverse problems like uh, seismic full waveform inversion, where you got a one single model and you uh, sample sparsely at the surface say with the receivers. So the receivers are mathematically equivalent to the point annotations. And the reason why you can segment everything is that just like the wave field goes everywhere, regardless of how sparsely you sample it. Uh, the same is true for the uh, states in the network that propagate from the input data to everywhere through your image, if you have a deep enough network. Um, and the back propagation is also the same that just originates from those uh, uh, receivers uh, and or equivalently from the point annotations. Uh, so, Learning on one single example uh, follows all the same rules as in geophysical inverse problems. So, uh, so that was about 
sparser annotations to uh, speed up annotation processes or just to work with limited ground truth. But even that is not always possible. For example, if the ground truth has to come or the labels have to come from ground truth, and that can be too expensive for sometimes, uh, like medical data, seismic data, you have not everybody can do it. You need to get experts to annotate. And another problem is, of course, in uh, historical data and time varying settings, you cannot go back in time and collect ground truth. Uh, for example, in time lapse monitoring and hyperspectral uh, data sets, you cannot go back and figure out uh, what was at a certain place on Earth. So then you just have to work with what you have. You cannot get more annotation. Uh, one example is, of course, uh, geology. Uh, if you want to create geological maps, uh, you have to collect ground truth. You cannot just look at, say, electromagnetic data, or magnetic data, and topography, and just put a uh, point on the map and decide what, what type of rock is underneath the surface there. Um, and, and that is also a case where it would be very expensive to collect extra ground truth. Uh, in seismic case, we also know that, of course, drilling extra boreholes is very expensive and you cannot do that quickly anyway. So you just have to work with what you have usually. So uh, what do we do if we don't have more annotation, but we need it? Uh, well, we can resort to using higher level information. So not annotations, but uh, for example, image level tags. So this is a nice overview picture where we have an image. And the full annotation that we'd like to obtain is something like this. So just the horse and the person annotated. Uh, so the points, point annotation, what we discussed before, uh, we can work with that, but suppose we don't even have that, then image level uh, information is something you can use. So you would just train on pairs of images and tags, like what's present in the image. So here it, is, it has horse and person. So if you have lots and lots of images, then a network can start to discriminate and learn why certain images have these tags and get a reasonable accurate pixel level segmentation. Uh, in the geosciences, this is not very useful because if you look at um, like seismic uh, images and you ask, is this uh, geological unit present? It's pretty much any image will have yes. It's not like a distinct object you're looking for. And also in uh, mineral exploration, if you look at those uh, airborne electromagnetic maps or something, you ask, is there gold somewhere here? Then the answer is like always, yes. It's not, um, we really care about where things are. And it's not, it's not really, uh, the, the data types are not like this. It's not the background plus object. So that's, this is not very helpful in the geoscience in general. An alternative is to use quantitative, like high level information or, uh, prior knowledge, as we would often call it in the geosciences. And an example is, say, a natural image, just the image of a bear. And suppose you don't know exactly where an object is or how big it is, and you cannot annotate. In this case, you could, but we just, for illustrative purposes, say we can't. So, but you often are still able to just draw a bounding box. So you say, okay, I don't know what or what or where a thing is in this box. I just know there might be something in here. So if you draw, if you're able to draw the bounding box, you, that implies a maximum area or size of the object or cardinality of the vectorized image, like the number of non-zeros in that image. Uh, so because you know, I, I could draw, draw a bounding box. So the object is not bigger than what's uh, the bounding box itself. Uh, this. This is still not enough information to train a network because you also need a lower bound on what's in this box. So that often is just a, a small number that says uh, there is something. So it's not an empty box. So there is an object, I don't know where or how big, but it's at least uh, there is something. And the reason why that would maybe work is that everything in this image outside of the box, there's a lot of information that you're that you can say, I'm not interested in that. So if you have to highlight something in this bounding box, then it's going to highlight all pixels that are like that. So the bear, because that's the only thing that is really different from anything outside of the box. 
So what I'd um, like to discuss in the rest of the talk is how do you include such prior knowledge into training a neural network? Uh, different types. I just showed an example with a bounding box and like information about the size of an object and presence. Uh, and how does this work in the single image case where you maybe not have an object uh, background structure? And I have some examples of various uh, geoscience and image processing applications. So when we look again at the uh, notation of this, uh, the idea is that we're going to minimize a loss function, say cross entropy, that minimizes the output of the neural network G and labels uh, C. Uh, so the input data would be D and the network parameters are K. So this is what we standardly do if we have F labels. Uh, and note that if you have the size of a class or surface area information, like that would be like minimum, minimum, maximum size of that object you're looking for. Uh, they could be loose bounds. They don't have to be very tight. Uh, that is information that relates to the output of the network at the last layer. So that would be a state, the network state Y at the last layer N, which is just the output of the neural network. Uh, so that's a bit different than an inverse bounds where we typically care about uh, properties of the model parameters. But in this case, we care about uh, the final state. So in geophysics equivalent, that would be we care about the properties of the, uh, say, the seismic wave field at the last time step rather than the model parameters of the Earth. Uh, that's the, the equivalence here. So there has been some work in this area, for sure. And uh, people have exclusively focused on size uh, of objects. I will, I will also discuss some other types of prior knowledge you can incorporate. And the, the fact that um, the output of the network is what we want to uh, describe in terms of prior knowledge rather than the model parameters itself is causing some problems in uh, optimization wise. It's, uh, I'll show some details later. But some people have mainly proposed uh, introducing auxiliary variables and working with uh, like adaptive penalties or yeah, alternating optimization and variable projection schemes and or approximations of uh, the size of some object via like penalties on the sums of uh, network outputs. So they're uh, went through the soft max and they're just zero and one between zero and one positive values. Uh, so these things are uh, mainly motivated by people trying to decouple the optimization over network parameters versus regularization of the output. And these Alternating schemes, I think, introduce a lot of complications that are probably not necessary. So I'll just show what, what, what my proposal is to do. And first, we can think of the area of certain class. So if class one would be that bear and class two would be the background. If we have some bounds on the size of an object, then if we have two classes, the, the, the bounds, of course, relate in one minus the other bound for the second class. And A1, A2 are just scalar upper and lower bounds on the size of the object. Uh, my, my idea is to just directly translate this via some uh, cardinality constraints. So what that means is we, we form constraint sets of all network outputs of which uh, say channel one has maximum the number of A2 non-zero entries. So cardinality is just a number of non-zeros in that factor. And for the second uh, channel of the network output, you do the same thing. You just have a different bound. Uh, we don't need lower bounds here because in the uh, normalized uh, network outputs, they always sum to one. So uh, that's why we can get away with just upper bounds. What do one and two mean here? Uh, that's just the output channels of the network. So channel one would be the object class output probability map. And number two would be the background class probability map. Thank you. So training uh, a, a loss function for labels uh, subject to constraints on the output, you can write it down as this uh, in this form. 
So the set D would be the intersection of all constraints that you formulated. And in case there's no annotation at all, then the first, the whole loss function drops out and the problem reduces to just a, a feasibility problem. So Q is just a, a selection matrix that selects the point annotation. So from the full network output, you select the locations where you have the points annotated, if you have any. Otherwise, of course, this whole term, like in the previous slide, drops out. Uh, yeah, stochastic gradient descent is, of course, or variance are the really the standard method to, to train neural networks to find mobile parameters k. So now we could, of course, ask ourselves, can we just use stochastic projected gradient descent to deal with the constraints? So those iterations are written down here, where the first one is just the regular gradient step, uh, so the forward step, and the second one is the projection, so that's the backward step. Uh, if D is non-convex, then of course this is the not an, not an equal sign, that's why I have this one. And it's just a projection of the gradient step onto the constraint set. The, uh, it, it is, however, actually, not really much easier than the original problem because we still have this network function here. It's the output that is uh, constrained and not the parameters over which we optimize. So, uh, so these are the same two equations as in the previous slide. And the interesting thing is of course that uh, this is for backward splitting that normally makes your problem uh, break up into two simpler pieces. But in this case, it doesn't really work because the second part is still almost as complicated as in the beginning. Uh, so the question is why it's not working. I mean, you get iterations that are valid, but it doesn't really make it easy like it should be, or at least as we're used to in most problems. So if we compare this to more common inverse problems like image deblurring or in painting, we have almost the same iterations, except that, uh, what's in the constraint set are the model parameters itself. So if we're deblurring an image, the model parameters are the image. And in our case, the image is really the network output. So that's indicated uh, on this slide. So that's just a subtle problem of uh, regularizing the model parameters versus regularizing the output. And the output in this case comes from a neural network. So it's, a, it, it's just a more complicated problem. So one, what I came up with to um, deal with this issue is to use the point to set distance function. So it's uh, given a point Y, you want to find the point X that's closest, uh, but in the set D. And uh, the way to proceed uh, for this problem is to rewrite this using the projection operator, Euclidean projection onto the set D, uh, which, this expression will be zero if you're in the set and non-zero if you're outside of that set. So that's a, a known tool. And, but I, 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 as far as I know, it hasn't been used in combination with uh, neural networks or regularization of uh, neural networks. So what, it, what you can do is uh, you basically wrap any constraint set D into a differentiable penalty. It turns out you can differentiate this one. And, uh, the good thing is that the value of your penalty would uh, relate directly to the distance to feasibility. And uh, it doesn't penalize anything once, you, once you're in the set D, then the expression becomes zero. Uh, this can also become an exact penalty if you drop the square and it will still be differentiable. Uh, with the square, it's of course non-exact, but there's some uh, slightly different numerical properties. And the other uh, good thing about this is that however many uh, constraints you have, because you project onto an intersection here, you got one penalty function to, to, uh, with one penalty parameter to select. So just to show some examples, uh, these are the distance functions plotted in just uh, two dimensions. Uh, so here we have the distance functions related to the set of cardinality uh, smaller equal to one. So 
that set is just the axis of your coordinate system. And going away from those, you see the penalty increase. And this is a box constraint. So you have a zero box here. Uh, that's the constraint set. And then outside, the value increases. Uh, so yeah, these are just two examples of one convex and one non-convex uh, uh, distance function corresponding to these uh, two sets. So the interesting thing about this, uh, why I chose this function, is that the gradient is known in a, a closed form solution, just y minus the projection itself. So even though you need to compute the gradient, uh, you don't need to do anything with the projection operator. It just occurs again. And there's a few reasons how you can uh, uh, derive this result or understand it. One intuitive one is to just look at the picture where, for example, this would be an intersection of half spaces. If you have a point X and you project it, uh, the ortho Euclidean orthogonal projection, you see that uh, that direction is orthogonal to the level sets of the uh, distance function. So this is a, a negative gradient. Uh, the other way to see this is uh, the gradient can be, is directly a fixed point iteration on the a good, a appropriate choice of operator. Uh, so in that case, you don't need an objective function like this. This is just to monitor the progress. This would really be directly uh, be a fixed point iteration. So to, to put the pieces together, uh, I minimize the loss function with labels, if there are any. And then I add the distance function instead of the constraint. So this is the distance to the constraint set. And uh, one way how I usually like to write the network is just one equality constraint per time step or per layer in the network. Those are the, the same things. And So uh, what you see here, just one constraint per network layer, or it's a time dependent discretization of a differential equation. At the beginning, you have the input data that would be just the state network state Y at the first layer. And then all you just have at the end, the last layer will be state Y N. And that is what you uh, use to compared to the labels and to is the property you want to constrain. This is the output image in a way. Of course, there's one uh, nonlinear activation function in every layer. And what you see here, the structure of the network is uh, actually the ResNet, uh, but it were, this, this whole structure fits most neural networks. Uh, and I, I, I use some hyperbolic networks in the examples. I don't actually use the, the ResNet. So the next few slides are just showing how to get the gradient. And that is sort of a known uh, stuff in uh, PD constraint optimization or neural network literature should be as well. So I'll go very quickly. I just want to mention a few uh, things. Uh, so first, if you write down the Lagrangian, you just have your uh, objective, your penalty, and then you add every equality constraint using a multiplier P. So that is nothing different than what we're used to in PDA constraint optimization. If we then look at derivatives, of course, we need derivatives. The only thing I want to point out is that the projection operator occurs only once in all partial derivatives. And that is the derivative with respect to the last state. So that's, of course, the one uh, gives you an expression for the last Lagrangian multiplier. Uh, I think in seismic literature, it is also called the adjoint source. But the important thing is the projection operator occurs only once. So that's, uh, it doesn't make things more complicated. And then the final algorithm, of course, is uh, the adjoint state method or known as reduced Lagrangian or back propagation, where uh, there's a lot of stuff here, but just to show that it's really the same as what we know in geophysics, like you forward propagate, uh, you compute your final Lagrangian multiplier, that you back propagate to get your uh, all your multipliers in reverse order. And along the way, you can update your uh, model parameters uh, that are just based on the, uh, the states y and the multipliers p for a single layer. Uh, there's one more piece that we need to add. And that's, of course, the selection of the penalty parameter to enforce the constraint via the 
point to set distance. And in this case, we can just look at if we're making progress towards feasibility, then we don't need to do anything. But if we're not, then we can increase the penalty parameter a little bit. And so that's a simple strategy uh, that works in this case. So a few examples, uh, some image processing and uh, some geoscience applications where I show some of them have like bounding boxes. Uh, some of them have annotation from one of the classes and some of them have uh, no, no labels at all. So going back to that image with that bear. So this is uh, a joint image in painting and segmentation. We have a corrupted image with 50% missing pixels and we want to get uh, segmentation. So the whole data set is just this image. Uh, and we can still train a deep network. So what we're going to ask is find me anything in this box that is something, but it's different from anything outside of the box. So we have labels that say there's nothing here. And the constraints say there has to be something in here that's at least 10% of the size of the image, but not bigger than the box. And this is the result. And it works really well in this case. Uh, so this also shows you can train deep networks on single images if you have some uh, regularization. I ask, what do you mean by the object is 10% of image? Okay, so the lower bound of uh, the class that's yellow here is 10% mm -hmm. of the size of the image. So it basically says there is something in this box. Because otherwise, the, 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 you fit all labels by say setting everything to zero, basically. Uh, so it's so the, you, number, the number of points is 10% of the image? No, no, no. There, there's, there are no. there's only labels outside of the box. OK. So in the box, there are no labels. It just, it's just a constraint on the number of non-zeros in the final segmentation. OK. So it just says in this box, there have to be 10% of them have to be a yellow pixel. Okay. So it's really a lower bound on the size of the object that you hope to find. Okay. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's essentially the pro problem statement is find something uh, in the box that is different from anything that's outside of the box. Uh, for seismic data, you can think about doing the same thing. Uh, but it, it turns out it's a bit more difficult than these images where you have a background and object. Uh, of course, you see here that there's not obviously something. There's a lot of stuff that's all very similar. For example, suppose this is a bounding box for a geological layer or sequence of layers. Um, everything inside or outside almost looks the same. There's nothing distinct in here. Uh, there might be for geologists, but not, it's not visually obvious. So consider uh, a unit of interest. This is what you'd like to find. Uh, so we, are, we, we can draw a bounding box, suppose we know that, and suppose we can set a minimum size. We have a rough idea of how big this thing is. If you would have a different segmentation, suppose you get the yellow segmentation, that's completely wrong but it does fit all, all knowledge you have. It's still within the box. It has the same size and it follows uh, boundaries that are in the seismic image. And it also has the same uh, sort of geometry, the same curvature. It's so every property is essentially the same. So it's really, uh, this is not gonna be easy. Uh, so yeah, I won't show you examples of this where this doesn't work, but if you try the same as from the previous slides, it's not gonna work for these cases. So an alternative, uh, maybe slightly less ambitious goal would be to work with a couple of annotations. Uh, so some labels, and then use the prior knowledge about the size and maybe a bounding box as a regularization strategy to just improve the results. So, Here's a very simple example of what that could do. So if we have 20 slices, so that's a pretty small seismic data set. And if you got eight boreholes, then you can form, uh, yeah, about, yeah, you can form quite a few slices that have two columns annotated 
here we just look at two classes, so one boundary. Uh, so there's 20 pairs of these type of images. If you train a deep network, uh, just do it with just those point annotations, you get results. Uh, so these are the two channel outputs. Uh, so one of them is one minus the other. And the results, of course, don't really make a lot of sense. You see those very stripy artifacts from uh, that, that results from the fact that we have only columns annotated. Uh, yeah, you can plot the prediction then onto the data and you see it doesn't really follow any boundary uh, particularly. So this is not a use, it's a pretty useless result. Uh, and it just really simply, we train a deep network on very few data with even fewer labels. So it's just not working. Uh, the true annotation, uh, this is from uh, a data set that uh, I think Chevron annotated for a blind test. Uh, so this is some of the training data. So this is supposed to be, uh, well, true or what they think is true. So one thing we can, uh, yeah, just overview. So this is the final segmentation with the true label and then the error you see it's, uh, yeah, not good even though it's a simple problem, right? The, the horizon is pretty, uh, it's not, there's no big jumps or uh, steep curves. So it should be simple, but if you don't have enough annotation, it's just it's not gonna really work to train a network. So what we can do instead is use some very simple prior knowledge. And one thing I did is uh, suppose, you know, you're training uh, on data that has just two layers that you know that the, outputs of the network should be monotonically increasing or decreasing vertically. Like one of them should be monotonically increasing and the other one should be monotonically decreasing. Uh, that is the probability that uh, of the presence of one of the two layers. And by looking at the seismic image, you can just see that all these lines have a limited curvature. So you can put some constraints on the slope in the lateral direction uh, without knowing anything of your labels. If you just know you're looking for something in here, you can instantly derive the maximum curvature. So if I do those two constraints, so this time no bounding box or uh, size constraints on the minimum maximum size, just monotonicity constraints of the probability functions in the output and uh, a bound on the lateral variation. So that's just pointwise uh, bound constraints on the say lateral finite difference uh, that's also called a slope constraint. And these are actually the outputs of the network in that case. So they are uh, much better. So now we compare it to the true model here. You see, uh, it's not exactly the same, but it's almost the same. And at least it's a lot better. Uh, so here's the final result. So the prediction, uh, you see compared to the true one, there's still some differences, uh, especially at the end, it's always, you know, boundary effects at these, uh, Convolutional networks is just something you have to take into account. But in general, it's, uh, it's a lot better. So even though it's a very simple problem, it shows that uh, if you don't have enough data, you need something else. And, and constraints on the output can be something very simple that can help you also in the seismic case. Uh, so this is uh, the, the, one of the last applications I worked on. So I don't have much more uh, exciting seismic examples, but this is just a, a start to show uh, that things can be done in seismic case also, but it is more complicated than uh, object background type data. Uh, let's see, I can mention a few things. There's other types of prior knowledge. Uh, for example, here, I segment this image this time without a bounding box. And I use the same ideas in the previous uh, seismic case, except it's not uh, a layer, so I cannot assume monotonicity in one direction, but I can assume uh, that the object, the segmentation will be constructed out of the sum of monotonically increasing and decreasing uh, functions in both vertical and lateral direction. That is like uh, inspired by techniques like cartoon texture decomposition, where you decompose images in sums of simpler images. Uh, so the intermediate steps are not shown here. This is the final result. Uh, so there's no bounding box here. 
but we can still get a segmentation of an object uh, by using ideas about monotonicity and decomposition of complicated images in simpler ones. Um, I'll just skip some details here. Uh, yeah, this, you can do it with other images as well. Uh, so again, no bounding box, no labels. Just assume that uh, the object here can be written as a sum of monotonically increasing and decreasing images in lateral and horizontal directions. Uh, then you can not represent things very accurately, but you can still construct segmentations like that. So it's a really strong regularization approach uh, that can give you approximate outlines of images. Uh, so yeah, just to note that you need uh, typically for these uh, constraints, you need sufficiently large data inputs because the prior knowledge that you might have typically doesn't hold for small patches. Uh, if you know the size of an object somewhere, roughly, you have to have the whole object in your view and you, in the full image. If you take a small patch, then uh, it could be all the object or all the background. So uh, size is important here. So yeah, you often run then into memory issues if you use automatic differentiation because they in like standard packages like uh, TensorFlow or PyTorch, it will save all the network states. Uh, but you can avoid this if you use reversible network architectures where you uh, recompute the forward states while back propagating. So you can avoid storing all states. Uh, so that's just like uh, uh, if you reverse wave propagation and recover your uh, original time steps. That's essentially what you do in these type of uh, reversible approaches. So to conclude, uh, I think point to set distance functions are a convenient way to merge labels and output constraints on the network. You don't need alternating expensive alternating optimization schemes or introduce auxiliary variables. And uh, if you change your constraint, you just have to change the projection operator. It doesn't uh, uh, propagate in all your derivations or all your algorithms. So the, the software and like inter implementation of these things is pretty simple because uh, the penalty function or the gradient are always the same. It's just the projection that you plug in is slightly different. And yet yeah, by construction includes intersections of sets. So if you have more different types of properties you know something about, you can uh, directly include that. And uh, yeah, again, nothing changes in the implementation. And uh, yeah, I've shown a few examples. I got some more like uh, other types of examples, uh, but there's no time for that today. But yeah, it does work if you have a single image or uh, a, few, a few slices in seismic case. Uh, and while it's uh, maybe most suitable for data with object and background structure, you can also use it for problems where you don't have an object and background. So, cause I showed it for some uh, the seismic stuff but you can also get Nice result for things like aquifer mapping uh, and uh, geological mapping and hyperspectral uh, time lapse monitoring, for example. I've also worked on that. So these are a couple of uh, papers that yeah, this presentation was uh, based on. And that's, uh, that's my last slide. Okay, thanks a lot for, for Buzz for an interest, such an interesting talk. Anybody have any questions? Hi, this is Tom Herring. I have a question on your first one where you bounded the box around the bear. That uh -huh. came from a video, right? If you took that neural network and then applied it to later frames in that uh, video, would it uh -huh. successfully grab the bear again or would something go wrong possibly? Uh, for I haven't really tried this in the video setting, Tom. I just focused on just uh, images using this approach. Uh, but yeah, we took the image as a frame from a video to, yeah, to do exactly what you propose to see if you can use this for uh, other, other uh, for the full video as well. Uh, yeah, we did, I did some tests, but I didn't really write it down. But uh, yeah, it, it sort of, it works just like, um, yeah, just the original video that I segmented use, using the labels. Uh, if you can segment a slice in this way, then it also works for the full video.
uh, especially for those videos that are every frame is different, but it's the same. There's no object that appear out of nowhere, for example. Uh, those, those are the difficult ones. Okay. I have a question, which I don't know how to ask exactly, but I'm recalling, you know, not being an expert in seismic interpretation, the first time I see a seismic image, um, my brain, I'm trying just to see what am I looking at? And I start to work out, well, I can see there are layers. I can see that some layers are smooth and some layers are curvy. I can see the orientation of the layers. Um, is it possible to have learning that sort of starts from, you know, just a grid of pixel values and notices patterns like that at a very high level that this isn't just a bunch of pixels, but the pixels have patterns like layers and some of the layers are different from other layers and sort of iteratively tries to interpret the image based on some basically geometric concepts. Uh, yeah, you can do that because in, in this case, I used a simple geometry for one of the classes, but of course you can uh, train a network for more than two. You can train it for say five different classes. And then for every class you add different geometrical constraints. So for one of them, you could say this, this has to be things that have very high curvature. It cannot be flat, for example. Right. And, and for other classes, you can uh, enforce different geometrical properties so that the network automatically uh, segments the image based on those assumptions into different classes. And it, and it helped a lot, right? When you, as soon as you added that constraint, which you could see with your eyes, then mm -hmm. the network was able to train much better. Yeah, 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 definitely. So, so can a network sort of have like a lookup table of, gee, what shall I try? You know, and so that instead of you having to decide for it, we give it like a dictionary or, or, or a, a resource of these are the things to try for constraints and see which one works. Something like that. Um, that's a, I, I don't know. Uh, maybe that's difficult because. So the, um, it's, it's an infinite number, but you know, can it sort of discover which one will work somehow? I mean, I guess it's transfer learning, right? You want, you want it to learn from what worked in other cases. That's how a human works. Yeah, I mean, you could, of course, take a network that you trained on some similar data set that, you know, if you know it looks very similar and it had good results, you can start with that. Um, <laughs> yeah, but then sort of uh, always the question, how do you get that one then? Yeah. Um, I, I don't, I don't, I, I, it's, a, it's a vague question, but I, I just think um, the constraints seem really key. You know, that, that prior information, the, the human intervention in, in sort of choosing the, the most useful prior is still the mm -hmm. key thing. To yeah, have. if you don't have labels, then the information has to come from somewhere. So, um, yeah, and this is one way to, to do that. Uh, and that's yeah, I think it applies to many cases and many, many examples. Just curious in the case whether you could use the absolute value of the loss function to give you a sense of which of those potential um, different categories that were chosen was the best one. Um, I, I'm not sure. Can you, can you ask that again, the question? So I think Anne was talking about having potentially different choices that you would apply mm -hmm. and you try to decide which one of these is the most appropriate. And I was just asking whether the absolute value of the loss function associated with each of the choices, rather than just minimizing the loss function, you actually compare the absolute value to make a decision that this is the one that fits best. Mm -hmm. um, or the rate of decrease of the loss or something like that. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, 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 the thing to remember is if you have, um, if you enforce some properties on, on your network output that it cannot satisfy, then it will, the loss will stop to decrease. You will get stuck mm -hmm. somewhere. Because uh, you basically formed an inconsistent problem. Yeah. Uh, 
that that yeah that can happen but uh i typically assume you you select your uh, prior knowledge such that there there exists a, a solution so your constraints on the output of the network right yeah yeah so it's just on the like on the each image or, or on the like uh, the the whole set of the, the uh you, you apply different constraints to each output okay so each channel output has a different constraint okay uh yeah that they cannot be the same because otherwise uh they would be in conflict so they have to be different for every channel so and uh and at the end uh, after training do you i mean after the training when when you do the prediction do you need uh -huh. to do the projection at the end of the network or no? uh no no because your network is just uh, your your trained network at that point and the constraints do not uh are not part of that okay uh th yeah that's why this approach is um uh, i think nice because the distance function really uh, does not intervene with your network itself there's no guarantee that uh, the set will be convex right uh no uh, if you choose convex sets then yes but uh, those uh -huh. cardinality constraints on the size are non-convex okay yeah or if you select slopes that have to be larger than or smaller than zero like without uh -huh. zero included then it will become non-convex as, as well oh. um, so 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 the 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 chevron results you 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 show it's a it's a chevron create for open test or uh yeah these are uh they put that out for an seg workshop where you they had it like last week or so they had or yeah, they put it out a bit earlier but they gave data and you could just work on it and then uh, uh submit some results on a some test data and they would show the results at some workshop uh, okay. i just i didn't take part in that i just took the data and labels they gave to do some experiments like this Okay. Uh, so yeah, the quality of their segmentation, what, what we assume is true. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know, but it, it looks reasonable there, although it, you see some weird pixels a little bit, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah, you got to work with something. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? There is one question. So could, could I share my screen please with you? Uh, yeah, yeah I, I can stop sharing then. Thanks. You see my screen? Uh, yeah. yeah. So um, you speak about the, well, the, in your presentation, you have only two layers and uh -huh. you're working, you're, you're learning for training for that. This is a real uh, geoscience uh, underground in Jordan. Mm -hmm. So my question is very simple. Uh, this is a segmentation of this uh, underground. Uh, coming from effectively the seismic uh, interpretation. My question is uh, how many images you need for training your interpretation system for this kind of uh, no complexity of the real and the ground? Um, yeah, that's always a difficult question, but uh, yeah, but you can. Right there. Yeah, so the first thing you always have to decide is do you want to train one network to segment into a 10 different layers, or are you gonna train different networks to segment, uh, like say train a few different networks that distinguish between two units that, that's effectively the same output. And if you have a couple of networks with two layers or one network with 10 layers output. Uh, but yeah, those steep faults, I haven't uh, uh, tried these type of approaches uh, I still have to do some work on that. Because so, so far, I mainly focused on remote sensing and image processing. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, in reality, my, my, my main question is the following. You see this, this layer and this layer, there's a fail between these. This, this layer, this layer is the same. 
Mm -hmm. that in the time they are they fail and they disrupt in fact so my question my, my, my question with uh, learning is uh, how is it possible and which kind of uh, difficulties which kind of uh, effort we have to do to select the right part of the image to mention and to interpret that this layer and this layer is the same was the same in fact uh yeah, for those cases, you need enough uh, labeled information to make sure the network learns that those two are the same thing and they're connected through that fault. Um, so you need big enough images that show the whole area, but also enough labeled data to just indicate that. Uh, but it is people you train networks on uh, seismic data with big faults. It just needs typically needs more training data more training labels. So this, this what, what Philippe is showing reminds me of another question that I often have. One big constraint on uh, ge geological data, um, no matter what else is complex, most of the time, if there's not overturning, the, the sequence of the layers is the same from point to point in space. So how can that fact that most of the time that what layer follows what other layer is preserved mm -hmm. be applied as a constraint? Uh, that's just pointwise inequalities. Uh, that, that just say uh, the, the value of the probability of this layer always has to be uh, lower than this one, say up to, yeah, you, you construct a sequence of inequalities that give you pointwise information. So this pixel always has to be uh, above this pixel, basically. So the class two should that? be above class three, for example. That is a, a way yeah. to do that. Is, is that sufficient just to have inequalities or is there more information in the in the sequence being preserved that it's, it's really a, a, like a global constraint somehow? Uh, the same nope. order. Point-wise inequalities will get, is sufficient for to preserve the global order. Okay. You have to have an anchor point. You have to say what's at the top, for example. But Right. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Oh, anybody have any questions? So if there's no any questions, I will first to stop the recording. And if you have anything you want to talk with us, you can still uh, stay in the Zoom here and uh, just feel free to chat, okay? Thanks again, Bas. Okay, no for problem. such a Thank great talk. Thank you, bye. bye.